Our next speaker is Mark. Welcome, Mark. Mark's a father of four. He said he's not, not, not Indigenous, but he's part of the community and he's an expert in pre-hospital care with 30 years' experience as an ICP and educator. And he started his transformational journey as a cardiac community educator in 2014. Um, he says that this is the most fulfilling role to date and he feels privileged to work amongst some of our oldest cultures in the world and he's increasing his understanding and passion through close relationships with our local elders and communities. Uh, Mark, here's your clicker. Beauty. Oh, yep, that way. And which one's for up? You'll see my level of technology when it's wheeled out here in a, in a short period of time. It's a bit tricky. Uh, that's for next. Beauty. Okay. Well, hello, everybody, and uh, hello to those who are watching us on the, uh, on the live stream. Before I uh, make an, uh, an appropriate acknowledgement, I think I'll just give you a little bit more information on me, um, just so you know who it is who's making the, uh, uh, the acknowledgement. So, yes, my name's Mark. I'm a 56-year-old non-Indigenous man of Cornish and... Uh, <laughs> Irish descent. Uh, I am a husband. I am a, uh, a father of four of the best children ever to be born, but I may be a bit biased. I'm also a grandfather of three of the best grandchildren ever to be born, but again, I may be a bit, a bit biased. Uh, I come from a long family of farmers, yeoman farmers, and uh, I have been in the ambulance since 1985 on our work with the cardiac care team doing the uh, Aboriginal uh, cardiac care awareness stuff, which we'll talk about and how we've changed that name as well a little bit. So um, having said all that, I would now like to acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders as the true people of this country, uh, from and of this country, particularly the Wiradjuri people whose country we're in today. Also, I'd like to acknowledge any other Aboriginal or First Nation peoples who might be here with us today from other Australian countries or from overseas. Uh, like to pay our respects to the elders, both uh, present elders, past elders, and emerging elders. Okay, so getting on with a little bit, this is one of the headings that we've used for this particular yarn. Hopefully we're going to go on a bit of a journey. I'll tell you a bit of a story as we go. This is the artwork that we use for our heart yarns. Um, and this was gifted to us by Kelly Girard um, over at Moree, an Indigenous woman who gifted the painting some years ago to the Ambulance Education Centre uh, when she did her training. And uh, it, it lived for a time in limbo in a cupboard until it was rediscovered by a friend of Kelly's who rang her and said, look, would you like this painting to come home? She said, no, no, I gifted it to the service. So then it got dusted off and framed and sits on the wall over there. Kelly tells us after having a yarn with her grandfather, she painted this picture, they are turtles, and they represent the women, uh, including Kelly in her life, who her grandfather said were very strong women, and the shell represents the ability of these, these women to support things, and particularly their communities, which I think is pretty... Uh, important seeing that Kelly is one of our one of our paramedics supporting sick and injured people in in her community in New South Wales. So we've adopted this piece of artwork, and uh, with Kelly's permission, and uh, I get to wear it on my flash red shirt that they've given me just so I stand out a bit. So um, that's a bit of the story behind behind that. So here we go. How does this work? Excellent. Both ways is a philosophy that I'll, I'll talk about and I will draw a picture um, of a particular metaphor that we use to explain both ways, or that Indigenous academics use uh, to explain both ways. It's, a, it's a, uh, a metaphor that belongs to the Yolngu people of northeastern Arnhem Land, but they have provided it um, for those of us who are working in this particular educational space uh, to be able to explain this concept of both ways. Uh, a picture paints a thousand words, so we will wait for my technology to arrive in a, in a minute. So the acknowledgement we, we, we've done, it's really important. Um, I, I will give a warning that this presentation does contain uh, photographs of uh, First Nation peoples 
who may or uh, may not have died. I hope they don't, haven't, because I, I know most of them. Um, but I'm just uh, provide the warning so that we know. Okay, so getting on with the yarn itself. They tell me about 2009, somebody over in Building 127, which is our, uh, where our, our cardiac care guys reside, work from, had a thought bubble. And the thought bubble was perhaps ambulance could have an important place, an effective place within the sphere of Indigenous health education. Following on from that health bubble, um, there was some consultation through Central Western New South Wales. I think they picked 10, 10 communities where cardiovascular disease was a particular issue for the, uh, for the Indigenous people. I, I would also like to say that I'll use some terms interchangeably. You know, which one I use just tends to fall out of my mouth. Aboriginal, Indigenous and First Nation peoples, if that's okay. Um, but also acknowledging that these are not traditional Indigenous terms, that they are labels that non-Indigenous people have used to, to uh, describe people, but um, I will use them with the utmost of, of respect uh, towards the Indigenous peoples. So I've put here a, uh, a pyramid and uh, just to have a quick talk about the structure of the ambulance service being a, a state government organisation answerable to state and federal governments and the organisation is hierarchical. So the way that we usually represent a hierarchical organisation is uh, using a uh, pyramidical uh, structure. I don't even know if pyramidical is a word, but anyway, <laughs> it is now. <laughs> so this represents the ambulance service uh, right up the top to the chief executive and to the, to the government itself. And most hierarchical organisations engage in some form of hegemony. Uh, hegemony is where an organisation or a group or a, a group of people or a culture exerts its influence over another by fairly forceful means. So the ambulance service um, has this pyramid structure uh, right up to the government um, from our, our proper, well, from our paramedics on the ground doing, doing the job. Um, and it has a fairly rigid and defined set of rules that we all have to follow. And if we step outside of those rules, we often find ourselves getting in trouble as the hegemonic organisation bears its teeth to maintain control. So it shouldn't be too much of a surprise that when when a hierarchical hegemonic, and I'm not saying that to be critical, it's just by way of explanation of the program as it was initially developed, um, would, it shouldn't be a surprise that it would sort of look a bit similar. So uh, the organisation put together a program. There was some consultation um, with Indigenous peoples throughout the Central West and... Uh, a, a package, I suppose, was put together. This happened all around 2009. It was meant to be rolled out in 2010, uh, but ended up being shelved for four years because um, my understanding, as it was told to me, was that they couldn't actually get anybody to pick it up and run with it. Now, this is not meant to be a story about me, but at about 2014, I was approached by a member of the uh, cardiac care team um, who knew that I was engaging in some Indigenous education studies. The reason I was doing those was that the educational, the education management had on a few occasions asked me to assist some Indigenous paramedic students uh, to help them get across the line so that they could remain in the job. And so I was doing that. I was happy to do that. It was actually a great lot of fun. And I'm quite proud to say that those paramedics are still in the job today. Very effective paramedics. Um, I wanted to make sure that I wasn't causing any harm. So I engaged with the university and was doing a graduate certificate of Indigenous education, which the cardiac care people found out about. 
and said, would you take this package and help move it forward? I said, yes, yes, I would. I would be very happy to do that. So they gave me the package and I went forward. And now, oops, no, we'll go back. We don't need that yet. Um, so the package itself consisted of a PowerPoint, lots of slides, some rubber stress hearts and some pens, some usual sort of tokenistic giveaway, giveaway stuff. Now the problem with the PowerPoint, well with the package, was the PowerPoint. It contained no acknowledgement, although the presenter should be able to do that. Uh, it contained no warning, although it was, it, it, it did have pictures in it of uh, Indigenous peoples. Um, and the first few slides, or the first couple of slides, were cram-packed full of statistics. So, you know, three times more likely, two and a half times more likely, 15 years less. A whole heap of negative information that is the lived experience of the Indigenous communities that we're engaging with. So did they need me or anybody else to actually come in and put these statistics up and talk about that? Well, the answer was no. Uh, and really all we were doing, and this yarn will be circular. It's hard for it to be linear. We will sort of talk about something here and come back to it again. So please bear with me. Um, so what we were doing covertly, we didn't know. We were actually reinforcing something that's known within educational, Indigenous educational spheres, as we were reinforcing internal deficit views. So if you have a child and you continually tell the child or the teenager or an adult that they are worthless, they are useless, they are whatever, negative, they become to believe that. They internalise that negative view that we impose upon them. And that's what was happening with those statistics on the slides. It was all negative stuff. There wasn't anything positive in it. Um, so that became reasonably evident when I started to experience walkouts from the engagements when I was having a yarn and the PowerPoint was up and we were talking about this sort of stuff and reinforcing these negative, negative views, when participants in the talk would look at you, and I'm talking young participants and older participants, and actually say, what's wrong with us? Why are we so sick? You know? Um, when there's nothing wrong. And the only reason, and I don't mind being political, the only reason that these cardiovascular and other conditions are rife within Indigenous communities is because of the lifestyles that have been imposed. 230-something years of, and I'll say it, the big word, invasion, and all of the negative things that have come with that and been imposed on the First Nation people of this country is what has led to, um, has been a major factor in the disparities um, between the Indigenous and, excuse me, non-Indigenous health in, in this country. So um, people were actually getting up and leaving the, uh, the presentation. And in one particular instance, I, I'd, uh, I'd asked a, a, a young Indigenous health practitioner to mentor me through this and uh, we were at a presentation of his particular group and the PowerPoint was up and we were going through it and we we're going through all the figures and all the things that we need you to do to fix this problem for you and people were getting up and walking walking out and one particular elder was sitting at the front next to me and there, she was the, about the third, fourth person to get up to walk out and she gets on, she's just walking past me. And I said, oh, auntie, I said, where are you going? She said, oh, home. And I said, well, I'm not finished yet. She, she, sorry, but she goes, oh, that's what you think, Whitey. And she goes and left. And I thought, oh, this is not good. Um, so I had a bit of a yarn with my mentor. And he said, oh, no, that's all negative stuff. You've got to get rid of that. You know, they don't want to hear that. They know that. 
we already know this, you know. So walkouts were, uh, they still happen a little bit now, but not as much as they were when, uh, when we first started. Community consultations that were extremely, extremely important. So whenever we're moving into a new community and we want to engage with that community with these heart yarns, we always try to get access and have the yarn with the local elders first. Now this does a couple of things. It, uh, it gives the, the knowledge that we're sharing to the elders first. So they actually have the knowledge before other people in their communities. So, uh, so that means hopefully that when they go down the street to do their shopping, they don't hear from somebody else about this ambulance bike who's just popped up and been saying this stuff and they don't know anything about it. So respectfully, we try to get the knowledge shared with the elders first in any community. Now, if the elders, if there aren't elders in that community, and that, that happens a, a bit, um, the Aboriginal healthcare practitioners in that, in that area will do it, do it, uh, we'll have the, have the engagement with those guys first. Um, and we ask the elders and the healthcare practitioners and community members when we're having the yarns, if they would feed back to us and give us some cri uh, constructive criticism and also give us any guidance as to whether it is appropriate stuff that we're saying and the way that we're delivering it, whether it is actually appropriate for their communities. So what we've ended up with is the heart yarns, and there's more than just the heart attack one now, uh, the heart yarns that perhaps I might give in Lightning Ridge may be tailored a little bit, given a different way, at Kamaragunja, uh, down on the, on the state border between Daniloquin and Shepherd and in, in that area there. So it's allowed us to tailor the yarns specifically to uh, the different communities that we go into. And so community consultation also um, doesn't just happen once. It's an ongoing thing because the communities that we're engaging with, um, sometimes the structure of those communities change. So if we go there one time and have a talk about heart attacks and then we go back, say, in six months' time to have a talk about strokes or rheumatic heart disease, whatever it might be, the, uh, the group may have changed. The dynamics of people move out, people move, move in. And so we always try to have a consultation with the elders or the, the people who are running the, the groups prior to every engagement just to make sure that it's still OK to say what we're saying and to say it the way that we, we want to uh, or that we, we think that we can say it for them. So um, consultation is not just something that we do once. It's an ongoing thing um, every time we have a new engagement with a new group or uh, with the same group. So uh, it's really important and to listen to the feedback from those consultations, not to go in saying, this is what we've done, this is why we're going to do it, you will accept this. It's, we, we change this based on the feedback from the elders or the health practitioners or, excuse me, <coughs> the communities. So what guides this? Okay, there's a, a philosophy, and we just saw a slide there before that says both ways. So both ways is a philosophy it's promoted pretty heavily by a Dr. Robin Obar, who is a lecturer at a university that has a particular Indigenous education school attached to it. And uh, Dr. Obar really promotes the both ways, or you may have heard of it, um, spoken of as two ways education. And this is where, as Western Anglo educators, couched in, in our Western uh, academic paradigm, um, we actually get off our high horse and we pay attention to Indigenous learning principles and how we can use the two together to make sure that important knowledge gets shared. And both ways philosophy is, is, is how, what we look at um, to do that. And it's a philosophy where 
we, we say that no one educational paradigm dominates the other. They are both equally important. And in actual fact, when we're speaking in Indigenous communities, there may be more than one um, Indigenous group there. There could be people who come from Kamilaroi lands and from Wiradjuri lands or Yorta Yorta lands all in there. So there may be even more than one Indigenous educational knowledge paradigm within that group. So the idea is that all are equal, all are as important, and how can we bring them together and utilise all of them uh, to make sure that the important message, the important knowledge that we're trying to share actually gets across to the people we're sharing with, how to, to ensure that they can uh, learn it. So, both ways philosophy, and both ways philosophy is, yes, okay, supported by a particular metaphor. Now, a metaphor, um, and I may be you know, speaking to those who, who know this already, but a metaphor is a, is a way to impart knowledge using an example that is um, not an absolute truth, but just a way to help with the with the, um, the learning process. So we, we will talk through something um, and it actually has a, has a second meaning for what it is that we're trying to, uh, the, the knowledge that we're trying to share. So at this point, could I please ask for the whiteboard or I can just not be lazy, go here and get it myself, because it is on wheels. <laughs> Hurry up, hurry up. No, that's a blackboard. <laughs> oh, I made that joke out of the back and they didn't get it. <laughs> eh? <laughs> so I'm going to hold the pen on my nose. <laughs> Although uh, 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 it is a whiteboard, not a blackboard. I think that'll be right away, run away on me. So can everybody see that? Not too shiny or whatever? Okay. So the Ganma metaphor belongs to the young people. Uh, northeast Arnhem Land, the elders and the community members came up with this and uh, are happy to share it with everybody and anybody. So we thank them uh, for, this, for this knowledge. So the Ganma metaphor relates to a wetlands or a marshlands on the coast. I uh, will represent that just by a simple circle. Well, sort of a circle, maybe a simple leg. So can everybody see that? Okay, so that is a wetlands into which from the land flows freshwater creeks. I will just represent that with one single blue arrow. Flows into the wetlands. On the other side, bear with me, I just need some lubrication. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> On this side, of course, water flows into the wetlands, the marshlands from the sea. Okay. The water coming in from the land represents traditional indigenous knowledge. It's coming in from the land, into the wetlands. The water coming in from the seaside represents knowledge from overseas, Western knowledge coming into the wetlands. The two lots of water come into the wetlands and they mix together. Now, just for a bit of academic speak, Professor Martin Nakata, who is a Torres Strait Islander man, talks about this, teaches this, and he also talks about the cultural interface. Wherever there is something going on where two cultures meet is the cultural interface, and it can be a place of conflict, but hopefully out of that conflict comes new ways of knowing, uh, new ways of being, and new ways of getting on. 
And so the wetlands, again, my metaphor for the wetlands can also be seen as a cultural interface for the purpose of what we're talking about. But a cultural interface can be anywhere where one of our non-Indigenous educators is engaging with an Indigenous student. That is a cultural interface. The two cultures come together. So anyway, these two lots of water come into this wetlands, they hit each other and they swirl around. And they mix. And the turbulence of that coming together and the mixing is evident on the surface um, by a foam that is produced. And so this particular metaphor of Ganma looks upon that foam as being the new knowledge that is produced by the coming together of traditional indigenous knowledges that are flowing into the wetlands from the land and knowledge from elsewhere overseas, Western knowledge coming in from the ocean. Is this making some sense? Yeah, pretty cool, isn't it, really? It's, it's, it is. Um, so this is the Ganma metaphor, and this is what uh, overrides both ways, and Ganma actually, I won't say override, underpins what it is that our, our, our um, unit, the cardiovascular unit, is trying to, trying to uh, do with, uh, with Indigenous cardiac care education. So this is always in the back of the mind, this Ganma metaphor and the new knowledge at the cultural interface. I'll just put it away for the next time. I tried to make this presentation linear, but it just didn't work. So I'll be probably popping backwards and forwards with stuff that I say. Yarning also known as storytelling, is a very, very, very important part of sharing knowledge with First Nation peoples. Um, and in actual fact, when we were starting to deliver this program to communities, one of the, one of the feedbacks from the community themselves, from elders and from um, the Aboriginal health professionals that we were engaging with, was to ditch the PowerPoint, you know, and we'd hear from a lot of people, we just like to yarn. We like to see pictures and we like to yarn, we like to share stories. So we have actually included yarning and storytelling as a vital part of any engagement we have in any Indigenous community um, that we're, we're with. Um, those stories, and we invite people to share their stories with us, and uh, we make sure that they know that the stories that they share will be treated with respect. And um, we usually take their names out, but we will, if we're sharing the story with another group, we'll say, oh, an elder from somewhere told us this story and has given their permission to share the story with you. So over time, the different yarns that we've got have grown with the inclusion of the stories or the yarns that have been shared with us and that the people have given their permission for us to share with other, other people. This is extremely powerful because now it has real Indigenous content inside it. True stories from the mouth of the people um, who have experienced the different things that they're sharing with us. And when we can share that with other community groups, then, then the, those groups usually say, oh, well, here's my story. Uh, so just as an instance, I suppose, the Torres Strait Islander man who happens to work for an Aboriginal health service down where I come from, um, at one of these engagements, said, oh, I'll tell you the story about my heart attack. And uh, he did. He said, I was mowing, mowing the lawn. He said, oh, I've got this funny pain in my left rump. So that's a bit funny. He said I was a bit sweaty and a bit short of breath. So he left home and he drove to the health service. <laughs> And he saw a doctor, and luckily at the Aboriginal Health Service, the doctors are switched on to Aboriginal Health. So he said, you better come in, and gives him a work over, does the ECG. He's having an AMI. And so he doesn't mind us sharing that story and also just saying that his heart attack was re a real, truly pain in the ass. Uh, because it's in his left, his left rump. He's happy for us to share that story. But those stories get included into all of the heart yarns that we've got, and they really do 
increase the power of the yarn when we're sharing it. Not only that, we get stories that um, people tell us like, well, I've had two now, and with permission I'll share this story, two in, Indigenous women um, who, who spoke of their heart attacks presenting to them as left ankle pain. One, one of the ladies had the left ankle pain for a while and was actually being treated for arthritis until things got a little bit worse and they identified that it was a heart attack. It was an MI that she was having. And um, the treatment for the MI, she's not had the left ankle pain since. Now, there's been two stories. So that's interesting for us to look at what's going on here. I have asked some questions. I'm led to believe that it's extremely rare but not unheard of. Um, sign of an MI, but I don't know. I need somebody who's more cleverer than me to sort of say, yes, that is so, or no, it's, no, it's not. But, so we, the, the potential also for sharing what I'm trying to, point I'm trying to make here, I suppose, is that we also can gain knowledge both ways um, by the sharing of these, of these stories, having these yarns. Art, I said, there were many communities said that, you know, we like pictures and we like drawings and stuff, so I tend to use a whiteboard a lot. Sometimes when I introduce you to a friend of mine in a minute, um, well, actually, I'll introduce you to a friend of mine now, because it's the appropriate time, I think. Um, so this is why we, we actually draw. People have said, oh, why don't you just take a photo? Well, uh, no, my apologies to anybody here who's a photographer. Uh, but anybody could take a photo and put it up. It doesn't show any real sort of input, I think, to the, to the story that we're telling. So, in terms of the heart attack heart yarn, I was really struggling with how to get across the concept of block coronary arteries and how they you know, lead to the heart attack and all this sort of stuff. And as part of something that's going on in my world, my... Uh, my psychologist, who I think is a bit, but anyway, um, said, go forward, young man, and meditate. Now, I don't have a problem with meditation. It's actually fantastic. So if you ever want to engage in meditation, do it. Um, it is really, really good. Uh, I was looking for somewhere to meditate, and I found, I found a, a tree. I found a uh, red river gum, and I was meditating there, much to the chagrin of passers-by who all live in the bush who were yelling out, dickhead, what are you doing under that gum tree? He's going to kill you. You know, it'll drop a limb and widow-maker. But anyway, I persisted. Stayed stuck underneath the, uh, underneath the gum tree. And uh, I'd finished one day and I put my hands down <laughs> to lift myself up. And I thought, oh, really? The tree showed me a way to explain um, what's going on in the heart during a heart attack. So bear with me. This tree is a friend of mine. It lives between the Murray River and the wetlands down where I come from, the Wonga wetlands. And uh, I'll introduce you to my tree now. Bear with me. Is this an exact representation of my tree? No. This is drawn a bit different every time. Such is life. So I'm going to make the assumption that everybody in this room has seen a river gum in the past. And I sometimes think this tree follows me around as I drive out to Walgut or Lightning Ridge and go across those warren bulls. And you see these trees all there. Sometimes I think, oh, there's my tree. But it's not. I don't know, he's following me around. But he doesn't. Okay. So now we'll give the tree some leaves. So here it is. A river red gum growing strongly between the Murray River and the Wonga wetlands down at Albury. We see the tree growing strong and healthy and we see from the bottom of the trunk roots 
come out from the bottom of the, of the trunk of the tree. We see those roots going along the surface of the ground before they dig into the soil and provide the tree with all the nutrients and the water that the tree needs to survive. What then do we think would happen if one or more of those roots were to become blocked? What's going to start to happen to the tree? You're allowed to call out the answer. It's fine. What would happen to the tree? Well, it's going to get sick, isn't it? And then eventually, if nothing happens to help the tree, it will die. But it's a living thing. It doesn't want to die. It wants to live. So it sends us messages. Hey, I am unwell. If something doesn't happen, I will die. So we start to see the tree. The leaves will start to yellow and dry off. And we can look at that tree and go, hmm, that tree doesn't look very well. So if the problem isn't fixed, and I'm not an arborist, so I don't really know how to fix a tree block, root blockage, but that's, you know, this is just a metaphor, a way to promote understanding. So if nothing happens, the tree will get sicker and we will start to see the tree. lose some of its leaves. It's getting sicker, it's moving closer to dying, but it's still sending messages. Look at me, I'm not well. Eventually it'll drop branches and die. So its roots have become blocked, it's not getting the nutrients it needs. It sends us messages that hopefully we can look at and go, okay, there's something wrong with this tree. And if we were able to, I don't know if we can, unblock those roots, then everything should be okay. Rightio. So then, now this will look for a moment like a big strawberry, so just bear with me again. So over here we'll now draw a heart. Neither completely anatomically correct because I don't try to draw each and every coronary artery absolutely right. But now we talk about how the heart actually has a tree growing out of it. And that tree is called the aorta. Okay. <laughs> All right. In actual fact, it looks so much like a tree. What's the first part of the aorta called? That's right. It's the trunk of the aorta. So here we have the aorta coming up out of the, out of the heart, and it branches off. Again, not anatomically correct. And at the bottom of the trunk of the aorta, there are roots that come across the surface of the heart before disappearing because they dig in to the tissue of the heart, providing the heart, I better draw the arch. There she goes. Okay. Can you see the metaphor? How we use the gum tree and its blocked roots as a metaphor for block coronary arteries and the heart. Now the heart, again, is a living thing. It's an individual thing that lives inside our chest, behind our brisket, a little bit to the left on a tilt above our diaphragm. It's living. That's where it, that's where it lives. It's a living thing. It wants to live. It does not want to die. What happens when one or more of the roots of this aorta tree become blocked. What happens to the heart? It becomes sick, and if nothing is done, it will die. Now the heart, just like the tree, it is a living thing. It doesn't want to die. So like the tree sends us messages, the leaves drying, yellowing, falling off, nothing happens, they all fall off and the branches fall. The heart sends us messages that we need to listen to. It's not an AMP lesson or a quiz or anything, but what are some of the messages that the heart will send? What will we feel? 
Yeah, yeah, all of the above, I think, because I can't really hear, <laughs> you know. Uh, but at this point, we're also using, because we have a partnership with the uh, Heart Foundation, we're using their fridge magnets, and all of the participants have a magnet in front of them, and it says across the top of the magnet, pain, pressure, tightness, or heaviness in the chest, arms, up the neck, into the jaw, through to the back or into the shoulder. So we talk through that as the messages that the heart will send when it is sick and dying because the roots of the tree are blocked. Um, however, those messages don't always get through. And so the heart sends sort of like a second set of messages just in case, which are the messages where the person can become unwell, feel sick, get that cold sweat, short of breath and dizzy. And this is the way that a lot of people, not just Indigenous people, but a lot of people actually feel their heart attacks. So they don't get those first lot of sort of textbook signs and symptoms of a heart attack that we're used to, but these secondary ones come through. Now, when you get short of breath, dizzy, you're feeling sick and sweaty, that could be the flu as well, which lots of people think, oh, I just feel unwell, I'll go and have a lie down. And uh, so for the period of the lie down, the myocardial infarction is getting, or the heart attack is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and more damage is done. So we, we, we try to push the, the, the platform of listen to these messages and think about them as coming from the heart and the heart is trying to say to us that I'm unwell, I need your help. And then that rolls into zero, zero, zero and, and those sort of conversations. So you see how that might work? It's working pretty, pretty good. The, the communities are saying to us, oh, that was really good. We like, we like that. And so we use this particular metaphor and art to, to help get a message across about um, heart attack. This is for the heart attack yarn. We have others for all the other yarns. So we're using art and metaphor and gum trees And hopefully what, what we can see is sort of two-way or both-ways education. So we're using metaphors that people are really familiar with and can understand to help get um, our medical science across about, about heart attacks. Uh, where do I put that thing? Here we go. Let's see where we're up to. How am I going for time? Can anybody? About two minutes. Oh, two minutes. Okay, that's fine. You Thank you. To take your whiteboard Thank you. Yep. Uh, we use activities as well, which, which a lot of the communities said, oh, we like to do things. So there are activities where we've made uh, big jigsaw puzzles to put together in terms of when we're doing stroke and things like that. Relationships, and this, this is really, really important with this particular program. And what we're trying to do is to make this a circular program, not a come in, say something once and disappear, feeling good about ourselves. A lot of the communities that we're engaging with, we are now into our third or fourth year of going back uh, to those communities and getting, we receive um, requests from other communities who have heard about the program from communities we've previously been to that um, could we come and, and engage with those, those second communities as well. We also have relationships, um, partnerships that we've, we've now got very strong with the Heart Foundation um, Stroke Foundation, Rheumatic Heart Disease Australia. Um, so whenever we have an engagement and I feed that information of where and when and how many back to the, the um, uh, cardiac care team, I also feed that information back to the Heart Foundation if it's been the heart attack yarn, the Stroke Foundation if it's been the stroke yarn and the um, uh, rheumatic heart disease get those figures as well so they can add it to uh, their figures as to, as to what's been taught out in the in the communities and it also keeps them on the good side that they're happy to provide us with the resources that we that we need um, which is all very very important measuring outcomes so one of the first things that was said to me how are we going to measure outcomes and I said well look I don't really know um, but be patient and so that pays off. So there's a couple of ways that we measure outcomes. There's the, the Western way of measuring outcomes where I'll, we'll go out and we'll have a, uh, an engagement and I feed back where the engagement was, um, how many people attended the engagement and what the topic was. And over time, those figures 
have increased, which we could probably take to, to indicate the popularity and the appropriateness of the program as more people attend and more communities ask for um, the yarns to come into their, into their communities. But the important outcome is, are we making a difference? Are we saving some lives? And uh, harking back to Dr. Obar again, um, she, she talks about the, uh, the um, narrative inquiry approach, which comes back to storytelling and yarning. And so we're just patient. And what we find now, when we go back to communities, we're starting to get stories um, of, hey, we remembered what you said, my brother got sick. Um, he was sweaty, he wasn't feeling really well. We got him to the doctors, now he has stents. I've had uh, people in, in communities um, drive past in their car and see me turn around and come racing up to tell me a positive outcome story based on what they heard during our, during our programs. Um, the other outcomes too are the word, other word of mouth stuff in terms of the program being accepted. Uh, um, we hear many comments now of, you say it our way, um, we get many people come to talk to us, talk to us, um, but your program really is of value. We like it when you come and what you're, what you're saying. Um, just recently we were asked to go back and engage with the Literacy for Life people um, at Collar Enterbri and the community actually pushed for the ambulance yarns to come back so other people in their community could have access to the, to the knowledge. So basically we're using a mix of indigenous yarning, uh, listening to the stories to measure our outcomes, as well as the typical white fellow way of graphing and documenting and counting numbers. Okay, so that's how we're sort of measuring outcomes for this. So the yarns that we've got now, and these yarns have been developed following the request of communities. So it started off to spin a heart attack thing. So now we do stroke. Anything that I can remotely attach to any cardiovascular um, outcomes for patients become a yarn for the community. So we've got the heart attack heart yarn. We've got the stroke heart yarn. We've got the rheumatic heart disease heart yarn. The diabetes heart yarn the asthma heart yarn, because all that wheezes is not asthma, and methamphetamine was one that the, the communities really were asking for to start with, and uh, we can absolutely fit that in for communities because of the uh, cardiovascular effects of long-term use. This usually happens, I get a hook or a crook, and they pull me off the stage, which is good. Okay, so here's some pictures. This, this is a mob out of Kamaragunja. And these pictures are put up here with permission from, the, from these guys. Uh, this was a very, very pleasing engagement. This was a Father's Day thing. It's really hard to get young men of any culture together to talk about health. But Freddie, the health worker out at uh, Viney Morgan at Kamaragunja, managed to bring these guys together. There's a fellow in there, I won't point him out but he actually gave quite a strong and moving oration at the end of the engagement. His father had recently passed from cardiovascular disease. It was so strong an oration at the end, we ended the engagement and we, well, I couldn't top it. It was, it, was, it was welling up. He actually went home and came back with a carved snake and presented it to our um, cardiac team because the snake had been carved out of the root of a red river gum. And uh, he brought that back, very, very treasured thing for us to, to have and to, to be gifted. And there I go, I've disappeared. Can I bring that back up at all? Thank you. This is Mr. Insides Out and the Heartinator. Breaking all number of copyright rules here. The Heartinator used to be used by the Heart Foundation in their Heart Start Mob Style. They stopped doing that. I thought, well, I'm not giving him up. He was really good. So now this is one of the things we do for kids in schools. And he's just a recycled whiteboard with a funny fella drawn and all those organs get stuck on because they've got magnets at the back and the kids build him and then we talk about the importance of all those organs and where they live and the importance of the heart, keeping them alive and good food and exercise and stuff. And this mob here at the um, 
AWARS, the Albury Wodong Aboriginal Health Service, that was our rheumatic heart disease day. And in terms of measuring outcomes, a particular auntie in that picture. So they're, they're what I call my puppets, and not really, they're just polystyrene balls with eyes stuck on them, painted to look like the germs, the bacteria that cause rheumatic heart disease. Um, dynamite represents penicillin, and it was designed to, to sort of make things a bit lighter for the kids who end up on the almost lifelong prophylactic penicillin injections that they have to have. But a particular participant on that day came into my tent, and because we've been coming around and around and around, she walks in and she goes, <laughs> oh, not you. Look, I've got the magnets on my fridge. And I know that, you know, I can get this pain or this heaviness here in my chest and it can go in my, heart, my arms. And, you know, I mightn't get that. And I might just feel sick and sweaty. And she reeled it all off. And she said, can't you just sign me book and let me go? And I said, auntie, you have made an old man's heart very, very happy because, you know, you've been paying attention and you're not but sit down and shut up because we're talking about rheumatic heart disease. So she stayed, she had the rheumatic heart disease yarn and she was quite happy to pose for the photo. Um, so that's another way of measuring this sort of narrative inquiry. These are some of the references. I'm very pleased to say that the academics who, are, who we're engaging with, who are guiding what we're doing, are Indigenous academics. Aboriginal Australians, Torres Strait Islander, Australians, and we even have one of my favourite is uh, Sean Wilson, who's a Cree man from Manitoba, and he talks about the importance of spirituality in Indigenous learning. A young Porter, Tyson Young Porter, uh, he's done a lot of stuff around Rewarana and Walgut, uh, Indigenous learning style. So, anyway, did that make sense? Okay, thank you. <laughs>